As we saw in the last lectures, as humans spread out across the planet, they encountered different diseases, and that resulted in genetic variation for disease resistance, but they also encountered different diets that contained different nutrients and different toxins. As a result, patients vary genetically in their ability to metabolize drugs because of their recent evolutionary history. The area of science that studies this is pharmacogenomics, and its idea basically is to analyze how much does individual human genetic variation affect our ability to metabolize drugs. It arose because we got a very serious signal in the late 1950s. An anti-diarrheal drug called cleoquinol was tested and found safe on Europeans. And then without testing it on Japanese, it was released in Japan and it killed some, hospitalized many, possibly in interaction with environmental problems in that post-World War II environment, but very likely primarily because the Japanese differed genetically from the Europeans. Individual and inter-ethnic variation in cytochrome P450s, these are called SIPs, and in N-acetyl transferases in 1977 and 1953, in both cases that was initially found through adverse drug reactions. So patients suffered and people wondered why and did detective work. Now we have information on human genomes and that's being used to find alleles and to predict variation in drug response using more sophisticated computer modeling techniques. The same gene products that metabolize drugs are also involved in processing toxins in food. In fact, that's why they initially evolved. And they process smoke and uh, the byproducts of other carcinogenic substances and are thus involved in the mechanisms that elicit cancer and shape the re evolution of its resistance to drugs. So this is not just about how well the patients process drugs, it's also about how likely are they to get cancer and if they get it, how likely are we to be able to treat it. Now patients vary in their drug response for many of reasons and only some of those reasons are genetic. So, they vary in drug response because they are of different ages, genders, ethnic background, weights, family history, what the time of day affects it, uh, their microbiota affect it, and also there can be placebo effects. Those are clinical reasons. And then in the environment, it depends on how well nourished they are, what other drugs they might be taking because there are drug-drug interactions their chemical exposures, their lifestyle, whether they are a drinker or a smoker, uh, and how compliant they are. All of these feed together to produce a particular uh, dynamic or kinetic of the drug in the body, and that leads to a particular intensity and duration of drug response, which can have a therapeutic effect and can also produce an adverse reaction or toxicity. There are two main classes of enzymes that are involved in drug response, the first of which are the cytochrome P450s. These are heme thiolate proteins, and their significance in processing toxins, and now drugs, is indicated by the fact that these are families of genes that exist in many copies. And the, they evolve by repeated duplication. They are proteins that are bound to a heme group and their color and their absorption peak, which is at about 450 nanometers, give them their name. That's why they're called cytochromes. In humans, we have 57 of these genes. They are bound to the endoplasmic reticulum and to the inner mitochondrial membrane. They mediate our response to toxins and to steroids as well as other reactions. There are 23 genes in the first three families and they account for about 75 percent of human drug metabolism. We're going to focus just on one of them. It's called CYP2D6, cytochrome P450 2D6. This is what a representative cytochrome looks like. It has two heme groups here and here. And life is using these heme groups to manipulate oxygen precisely. So you can think of cytochrome P450s as being surgical specialists in dealing with oxygenation reactions. 
which in chemical formula will look like this. You'll have some molecule and you can add in the presence of a cofactor uh, and oxygen to it. You can then produce a hydroxyl radical and water. <coughs> now cytochrome P2D6 is clinically important because of its variation. It was discovered in a case in London in 1977. There was a volunteer who had a hypotensive response, so low blood pressure, to debrisoquine, that's an antihypertensive. And then another volunteer in Bonn had increased side effects uh, taking spartine, which is antiarrhythmic. So both of these were related to variation in CYP2D6. It is now known to be involved in adverse reactions or decreased drug effects for many drugs, antiarrhythmics, antidepressants, neuroleptics, antianginals, opioids, amphetamines, and anti-cancer drugs like tamoxifen. So this is an extremely important mediator of the patient's ability to respond constructively to drug therapy. The percentage of poor metabolizers, you know, the jargon in, in this area of science is a PM for poor metabolizer, varies strikingly among ethnic groups. So here's some ethnic variation in CYP2D6. The ones here in this gray region are not functional. Basically what you can see here is that people who are of African American ethnicity, most of them have a much higher frequency of uh, allele 1 than do people of East Asian ethnicity. And American whites also share that with Africans. However, other Europeans have lower frequencies of that than do East Asians. So there's quite a bit of ethnic variation. And, and the, the point here really is Individual humans differ tremendously in the probability that you'll have a variant of this particular enzyme. Now, why is that important? Well, it can vary from two to three copies per individual. It metabolizes about a quarter of all of the drugs on the market. Its polymorphisms influence about 12 to 14 percent of all drug metabolism and that includes antidepressants, antiarrhythmics, anti-cancer drugs, and analgesics. Duplications reduce the efficacy of drugs that treat arrhythmia, Alzheimer's, and heroin addiction, but they improve tamoxifen in treatment of breast cancer. As a result of those facts, the drug industry now tries to avoid developing drugs that are metabolized by this enzyme because they cannot predict how individuals will react to it. It has a direct impact on drug rehabilitation. Two other cytochrome P450s, 3A4 and 2B6, uh, have variants that cause great var individual variation in how much methadone you need to give a patient to achieve a given blood concentration of that drug. To obtain a methadone plasma concentration of 250 nanograms per milliliter, a dose of methadone as low as 55 milligrams per day or as high as 921 milligrams per day can be required in a 70 kilogram patient. That's more than 16-fold variation in dose, and it's caused by variation in these genetic polymorphisms. It depends on which of those genes that particular patient has. There is another very important set of enzymes that are involved in drug metabolism. And those are the N-acetyltransferases. There are two of them, NAT1 and NAT2. They activate and deactivate both drugs and carcinogens, and they are active mostly in the liver cytosol. So they are part of the metabolic machinery that makes the liver such an important part of cleansing our body. Different alleles combine to produce rapid, intermediate, or slow acetylator phenotypes. They were discovered in 1953 in patients who were being treated for tuberculosis with a drug called isoniazid. The drugs that they metabolize include sulfonamides, many other drugs, and the metabolites of caffeine. So people vary in their reactivity to coffee and tea because of genetic variation in N-acetyltransferases. 
Europeans and North Americans are about 22 to 26 percent fast acetylators, and East Asians are 67 to 74 percent fa fast acetylators. So ethnicity is giving an indication, but not a precise read on the probability that a patient will be either a fast or a slow acetylator. This is what that molecule looks like. Its movable parts are in red. That indicates the, the part of the molecule which is going to be adjusting to the substrate. There is important genetic variation associated with cancer susceptibility. There are two major associations. One is that the impact of an environmental toxin on cancer risk depends on which genetic variant one has for N-acetyltransferase. And the other is that the ability of a cancer clone to resist chemotherapy depends both on the genetic variant it inherited from the germline and shares with the other cells of the body, but also on what somatic mutations it has acquired during the development and the clonal evolution of the cancer. Here are a few examples of how N-acetyltransferases interact with the environment to determine cancer risk. For bladder cancer, the NAT2 slow acetylator, acetylators are about one and a half times more likely to get bladder cancer, and those that have a combination of Na2 slow with NAT fast and current or ever cigarette smoking are nearly three times, 2.73 times, more likely to get bladder cancer. So here the interaction effects between the genes and between the genes in the environment are both important. For colorectal cancer, one of the most important cancers that hits people as they age, NAT1 fast acetylators had significantly higher risk of colorectal cancer than did the slow acetylators, and smoking intensity increased colorectal cancer risk among carriers of both NAT1 and NAT2 fast acetylators. For pancreatic cancer, one of the nastiest uh, cancers and one that can produce devastating metastases, NAT1 polymorphism interacts with dietary mutagen in intake and increases the risk about 2.2 to 2.5 times. And it does so in men, but not in women. So you can see that the genetic variation is interacting both with environment and with gender to produce different profiles of cancer risk, both because these molecules are involved in detoxification of things that could induce cancer, but also because these molecules are involved in how well the cancer cells themselves can resist chemotherapy. There is also genetic variation, as I've mentioned, to chemotherapy. So all cells in the cancer share the genetic capacity to process drugs with the abilities that the healthy cells in the body have. And so patients can begin life with different potential responses down the line to chemotherapy for reasons they inherit from the germline. However, cancer cells also accumulate many somatic mutations some of which may affect their ability to metabolize drugs and thus to resist chemotherapy. Chemotherapy applies very strong selection to competing clones and it rapidly se selects resistant clones. Some of that resistance is probably attributable to mutations in the genes that are coding for cytochrome P450s and N-acetyltransferases. We can use Genome-wide association studies, GWAS, to discover genetic variation for adverse drug responses. Here, it seems to work pretty well and it seems to explain a bit more than we can when we use GWAS to explain disease resistance. The reasons for that are not yet well known. And what we can see is that if you have a clinical problem like myotoxicity and the drug involved is a statin, in this case simvastatin, then GWAS has found a particular gene where variation is influencing that particular reaction. This is also true for uh, efficacy of treatment to a viral infection, uh, for treatment with anti coumarin anti anticoagulants, and for others. So the point is that we now have 
fairly good high-tech means of identifying particular genes whose variation is associated with adverse drug response. And that gives us hope that in this particular part of medicine, identifying individual variants is going to bring a clinical payoff. So to summarize, individuals vary in the alleles that process drugs and environmental chemicals. If they cannot process a molecule rapidly enough, it will build up and can act as a poison. Cancer cells also vary in their susceptibility to chemicals. This accounts for some of the evolution of resistance to chemotherapy. Knowing the genetic constitution of an individual and of individual cancer clones can improve treatment outcomes and can reduce treatment risks.